Attention projectionist. Make sure that your picture will be focused properly before the show starts. Adjust the lens so that the bells in the corners and the two words are all sharply focused. Now adjust the sound volume. That's all. When this bell system seal fades out, shut off the projector. Everything will be properly set for your show to begin. Everybody does it. After all, what's the new car if you can't make a little speed? George Allen here. That makes it even more just him. George is on the road five days a week. And with all that driving, he's convinced that he can handle speeds of 70 or 80 without thinking twice about it. Of course, he knows it's against the law, but with George, it's a kind of game that he plays every time he gets out on the highway. The object of the game is to keep from being surprised by the highway patrol, and he always looks behind billboards, even though he has yet to discover a patrol car hiding behind one. And then George spots something very unsettling in him. Can it be? Yes, it's a patrol car, and it looks like the patrolman is flagging him to a stop. As George pulls to a stop, he knows from the expression on the patrolman's face that excuses aren't going to do any good this time. The patrolman introduces himself and asks to see his license. So George figures that discretion is the better part of valor and fishes out his license. Our radar unit says you are hitting 80 miles an hour, the policeman says. Radar, George thinks. And that was one thing that hadn't occurred to him. Well, there's still a chance he can wiggle out of this one if he works it right. The patrolman takes him to a salvage yard and George knows what's coming. They'll walk around and look at a few smashed cars and talk a little bit. Probably driven by a man who passed on a curve, George says lightly, deciding to make himself comfortable. No, as a matter of fact, the patrolman tells him, that car you're sitting on was driven by an elderly gentleman who followed every rule in the books, except one. George thinks to himself. 
It looks like the last stop for a drinking driver. No, the policeman explains, I knew the owner of that car quite well. His name was Smith, and he was a very conservative businessman. On that particular spring morning, he was an extremely proud man. One, it was the day when his favorite granddaughter was getting married in a town about a hundred miles away. And secondly, Mr. Smith was the proud owner of a bright and shiny new car. He sat and listened to the powerful motor throbbing under the hood for a few minutes and then carefully backed into the street after looking both directions, of course. And then he felt the car respond quickly to a slight pressure on the accelerator and he was off. The wedding was to be at two o'clock and he'd allowed himself plenty of time. For keep in mind, Smith was a cautious man. The road was an excellent Texas highway and the new car was smooth. But he began to wonder how it would feel to go really fast for a short stretch. So he stepped on the accelerator. George feels sorry for two men he has never met. A man named Smith and a farm boy on a tractor. But after all, George says, Mr. Smith died because he wasn't used to speed, because his reflexes weren't trained. So the highway patrolman points out another wrecked car, explaining that this was a case involving something entirely different. Two people died in this wreck, the patrolman explains. And as the patrolman talks about it, George can almost see the man. Jerry Rogers, age 25, a good driver. Jerry was a truck driver during his working hours, and a good one. He had won a couple of safety awards, and he knew all the rules. On a Sunday afternoon, he liked to take his girlfriend and go for a spin in the country, have lunch someplace along the road, and just drive. Driving was his hobby as well as his profession. It was a lovely summer day, just right for spending a few hours outdoors. And as he backed out of the parking lot, he was thinking about a wide stretch of road without much traffic where he could really make some speed. Jerry never exceeded the speed limit, except when he thought conditions were perfect. And this was one time when everything seemed right. On a racetrack, Jerry would have been perfectly competent to drive at high speed. But the public highway is no racetrack. There was a moment of distraction when his fiancée put her head onto his shoulder. George flinches with the thought of what happened here. It was speed that snuffed out the lives of this young couple. And as he looks around, this salvage yard is no longer just a place of twisted metal and battered chrome and broken glass. It's a graveyard for dreams. Excessive speed killed a whole family in this car. A mother and her child died here. They were going too fast. He looks around and he sees in these scrapped hulks of cars a thousand epitaphs suddenly made real. A mute residue of headlines screaming death. And as he looks at the culmination of so many lives and so many hopes and so many dreams, he hears the patrolman's words. Speed gave none of these a second chance. At lesser speeds, they might have lived. And so George finishes his hour among the wrecked cars. And as he prepares to leave, he cannot help but think that 
but for the grace of God, his car might be here, twisted beyond recognition by the hand of impact. But he has other things to think about, too. However powerful the impact of this hour has been, he's late for an appointment and he's anxious to be underway again. In a few minutes, he's on the road once more, one of thousands of drivers sharing the sunshine in the smooth highway. And for a while, he will remember what he has seen, and his foot will pause on the accelerator before it makes the fatal step. But he is human, as well are, and we forget easily, even important things like the danger of speed. Perhaps he will remember, perhaps we will remember every time we climb into our cars. Perhaps we will remember and stay alive.